Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for spending your Saturday with us. Uh, my name is Diana Tsuchida, and I'm very honored to be uh, facilitating what I think is going to be a really fascinating and moving conversation today on the words we hold. Memories, stories, and experiences from our families on both sides of the Pacific during World War II. Um, it's illuminating to realize that the war uh, continues to be a defining moment for many of our families and that it set off this string of events that likely brought a lot of us to where we are today. And for the Japanese American community, the history of the war holds quite a bit of meaning on many levels. But whether you look at it from right here in California or in Tokyo, the thread that links us together is that somewhere down the line, we all share the lineage and ancestry of Japan. And I think many of our families have understood the war experience as something so much more nuanced than what gets told through dominant history. And it was much more complex for people than just America versus Japan, us versus them, good versus evil. Uh, because for so many Japanese Americans, both pre-war and Shin Nikkei, their government's enemy wasn't necessarily their enemy. And uh, there were families caught on both sides of the conflict, and not just military-wise. Uh, there were you know, people who left Japan and then found themselves in a prison camp in the middle of Utah, raising a family of their own. So the conversation today with our four panelists is about the extremely difficult choices people make when faced with something as life-altering as a global conflict. It is about the search for our family's truths that help us define ourselves in the broader Nikkei community. So it is within that spirit of story, sharing, and community that I'd like to introduce our panelists for this afternoon. Ayumi Nagata is a Shin Nisei who spent her elementary school years in Japan. Both sides of her family were affected by the war, uh, yet this is the first time she's explored the actual family history and their experiences. The story she will tell today was gathered from family members, family members and neighbors, um, but not directly from those who experienced the war. Nicole Cherry, who is Yonsei from her mother's side, holds a license in clinical social work and also owns a bridal shop in her hometown of South Pasadena. Nicole's grandfather, Shoso Nomura, was a member of the Military Intelligence Service and was assigned to the US Army Observation Group known as the Dixie Mission, uh, which was in the China, India, Burma theater. Sho signed up for the military while imprisoned in Gila River with his family. Known for his quick wit and humor, he kept copies of letters that narrate his experiences throughout the war and after. However, Nicole was never aware of the stacks of copies of his letters until he passed in 2016. So these discovered letters were treasures to her, giving her an intimate knowledge of her grandfather's 26-year-old self. Natsumi Shibata is a freelance filmmaker and assistant director who recently moved from Tokyo to LA. Natsumi's grandfather was part of a Japanese suicide boat unit called the Shinyo during World War II. His assignment was essentially to pilot a boat full of explosives and head for an American warship and, and drive into it. Um, however, his boat was attacked by an American warship and he dived into the ocean and survived. But as if that wasn't enough of a story, he was sent to a hospital in Nagasaki where he also survived the atomic bomb. <laughs> so that will be quite a story. And uh, lastly, Kristen Hayashi's interest in family stories has inspired a career as a public historian. While teaching US history to undergrads at UC Riverside and overseeing the permanent collection at the Japanese American National Museum, she repeatedly encountered the story of her great uncle, Private First Class Henry Kondo of the 442nd Regimental Combat Team. Kondo's life and legacy received a considerable amount of press as a result of being the first Nisei soldier 
from Pasadena to be killed in action. His incredible valor and bravery were underscored in the newspaper, yet letters that he sent to his family while he was in basic training and in Italy and France reveal his humanity, allowing Kristen to get to know a relative whom she was never able to meet. So with that, I'm going to pass it off to Ayumi. Hi everyone. So I decided to collect family stories, but what I realized is I really didn't have a cohesive story where there's a beginning, middle, and end. So I started kind of doodling and I realized it's kind of choppy, but that is the history that we have is it, there's no cohesion to it. So um, they're told in pictures. Um, so as I mentioned in my um, introduction, I spent my elementary schools in Japan, school years in Japan, and we were very much a 1990s nuclear family. So my dad, my mom, myself, in the suburbs, away from any relatives. So I didn't really get to hear any firsthand account of the war experiences growing up. Um, while I was in school, much like Japanese school children, what I learned from war was from Barefoot Gen, which is a comic book series about um, a pacifist account of the war. So it's a very, um, I think of a lot of school children in Japan, most of them have probably have read it. Every summer, the animated movie Grave of the Fireflies came on, which I often watch with my cousins. Um, it's a tale of a two siblings who survived the war, and it's very heart-wrenching and crushing in its themes. And then in sixth grade, I went to the Nagasaki Peace Park as part of the field trip. So much of the narrative and what I learned was how much Japan suffered, and that's the perspective that I received, and that's the narrative that I got from that. And years later, when we came to the US, that was the first time that my parents really learned about the other side of the Japanese war and the atrocities that Japan committed. So growing up, um, I, I vaguely knew that my grandparents were involved in the war, but I knew very little. So what I heard was things like my grandparents who lived close to Hiroshima saw the atomic bomb get dropped and saw the mushroom cloud. Um, f until recently, I thought my grandfather was a kamikaze pilot, which turned out not to be true. And my cousin, who actually grew up with my grandfather, the only story he could tell me was that my grandfather went ice skating on the frozen lakes while he was stationed in Japan uh, in China. So what actually happened, actually listening to the introduction about Natsumi's story, I, it's probably a very, perhaps a common story. Um, according to my a neighbor who told my dad the story. Uh, my grandfather was in the Japanese Imperial Army, and he's en route to Iwo Jima. And while on his way there, his ship was attacked, and he clung to life on a piece of plank for about a day until he was rescued by the Japanese. And it's very highly unlikely that he would have survived the war had he gone to, actually landed to Iwo Jima as most people were killed in action, or they were taken as prisoner of war. And obviously what this means is it would have changed the course of our family history as well. Okay. And once he was rescued, um, he was taken to Galapagos Islands of the East called Odasawara Island. And it's about 1,000 kilometers from Tokyo. And I don't know how much time he really spent there, but according to the neighbor, he was so fascinated by the flora and fauna of this island. And of course, as the name suggests, it was really rich in biodiversity. So it's said that he talked about his experiences here quite often. And in the meantime, my grandmother lost her first husband in the war. And I'm not sure what exactly happened or who he was. I just learned this recently only because I asked. Um, and in 1945, the war ended. In 1947, um, US, uh, 1947, Japan signed the Constitution, its new constitution, including Article 9, which outlaws uh, war as a means to settle international disputes. And after the war, my newly widowed grandmother and my grandfather got married and had five children, including my father. And of this time, I asked a lot of questions to my parents of what it was like, and I assumed that they really experienced the aftermath of war. But 
what my father notes is that everyone was singularly focused on economic development. So they, he grew up in a time when there was economic prosperity and he just rode the wave. Um, it was not a time of abundance, but there was just a hyper-focused need to just make things work. And lastly, I chose this um, image of a cabana, which is something that I, my grandfather really enjoyed and something that flowers is like a big thing in our family too. Um, no one in our family really has heard any direct account of our grandparents' experiences, and so these were all gathered from different sources. But one experience my dad has um, that he really remembers as a child is watching his father spending hours into the night um, gazing at his flower arrangements, which I think is a really beautiful contemplative image that I have of him. And I imagine that during that time, he thought about a lot of things, including what he experienced and saw in the war. And I often wonder now more than ever if he's ever considered that Japan is considering to change the uh, constitution to engage in war again, but we will never know. Thank you. Um, so next is Nicole Cherry. Hi, everybody. Um, so my slides are going to just run on a loop. Um, so it, it's not going to be as maybe cohesive. <laughs> Um, but hopefully the things I talk about kind of put things in perspective. Um, should I go with this? Oh, okay. And then next. Okay. Um, so this is the story about my grandfather. Um, show. He was born in Arcadia, California on October 1st in 1918. He spent his early life on, um, in Sierra Madre, and after Pearl Harbor, he was first located to the Tulare Assembly Center and then to the internment camp in Gila River with, um, in Arizona with his parents, brother, sister-in-law, and niece. Um, and when he was 25, he kind of got restless there, and he did enlist into the army um, and was recruited to serve in the military intelligence service and he was sent to the intensive language school for Japanese. Um, in 1944 they took him to communist China on the MIS Dixie mission and he was there to interrogate Japanese POWs and gather vital information. So some of the photos you see there are in um, China um, after 1945, when he, um, after the war, he was honorably discharged with a bronze medal, and he made his way to Tokyo, where he met his wife-to-be, Florence Seiki, also formerly of Pasadena. And then after the birth of their first child, Sho and Florence returned to their roots in Pasadena, and in 1961, eventually moved back to Sierra Madre, um, next door to the Nomura family home. He and Florence loved to travel, especially to Japan and to various MIS reunions, and some of the reunion photos are in there as well. They had five children, five grandchildren, and two great-grandchildren, and now he would have had three great-grandchildren. In 2011, he received the Congressional Gold Medal for his service in MIS, and in 2016, three months shy of his 90th birthday, he passed away. Um, that's just a general overview of his life. And as we said, or as Diana said, he was very witty. Um, so I am going to read some of the letters to you. Um, he was also judgmental. So just take that into perspective when I'm reading some of these letters. Um, I have to almost censor some of the language. Um, but you know, he was in his 20s. He was in his 20s, and you know some of these he's writing to his buddies, um, never thinking anyone else is probably going to read it. But he did keep these copies of these letters, which are just so amazing, and just really give you the firsthand narrative glimpse of what he was feeling and what he was like. And I decided to take excerpts from letters before the war, right before the war, and then after Pearl Harbor and when he was in. Um, in camp and stuff. And you just 
you just see the difference in, you know, a typical 24, 25 year old's life and how that dramatically changed. Um, so this letter was from January 1941. He's writing to his buddy Matsy, which he wrote to a lot, and I don't know where he lived, but he, um, they like to talk about girls. So <laughs> it's like he always had to catch him up on all the girl gossip. So um, this letter was um, about his Christmas Eve and Christmas night outings. And um, just to give you a little glimpse of what his personality was like. <laughs> um, so they had mutual friends too, so they talk about a lot of their, their, their group of friends. Um, Dear Matsy, this is Christmas Eve. Before I go on, go on any further, maybe I better tell you that Shiz is currently running around with a girl in San Marino that goes to YP and El Monte. So we hi-hos our merry way up to the wastelands of El Monte. What a lovely time. Even Shiz apologized to me for dragging him down there, dragging me down there. We stuck around until the party broke up at midnight. It was a church party. <laughs> and he took his girl and a girlfriend of his girlfriend. That's rather sloppy explaining, ain't it? We chewed the fat with these dames till about three in the morning. <laughs> this Shiz's girlfriend is the darndest, okay, I'm gonna edit some of these uh, <laughs> curse words, um, is the darndest piece of slant eye humanity that I've seen in a hell of a long time. She walks around by the name of Dorothy. Ever heard of her? If you haven't, you ought to congratulate yourself on what you're missing. If you can imagine, Yoshko, Florence, and maybe Ruby, a couple of king-sized boiler factories and pneumatic drills, a 16-tube radio with the volume turned up, stor a storm, all rolled into one skirt, you've got this dame. Wow, is she noisy. Niagara Falls is just a dripping faucet, so help me. <laughs> but this other girl that we took home, she was a honey, her name is Helene. Where she got that name, God only knows. She lives in San Gabriel, about three th blocks from me, and I just met her. Ain't that a, mm. <laughs> So I was talking to her in the back seat of Shiz's station wagon while Shiz was carrying on with his dame in the front seat, huffing, puffing, and listening to his woman blow her topper in conversation. Till about three o'clock in the morning, Christmas day, I was telling this Helene how I brushed my teeth with, with Ipana, Lux my undies every night, never take a bath without life buoy, never fail to use quick fingertip full of mum under each arm before stepping out. I don't even know what these things are. Um, never too much of a hurry not to give my hair a 60 second worth with vitals. How I'm improving my social ability by taking Arthur Murray's 10 easy lessons in dancing. And now never offend anyone because I use Kleenex instead of a dirty and nasty handkerchief. Then what happens, I ask you, at three o'clock in the morning, she tells me she's going steady, which is the same as slamming the door in my face. Matsy, ain't there no justice? So those are the type of letters he wrote before. <laughs> um, you know, and he, his sister Helen was living in Washington um, at the time, and so he would write her as well. Um, and so there were lots of letters to her. There's lots of letters to cousins. This um, letter that I was going to read was when he was in the Tulare Assembly Center. Um, this is June 20th, 1942. And he's writing a letter to a couple, a non-Japanese couple uh, from Sierra Madre. And, um, and he just, I like this letter because it explains, he really explains the perspective of the Japanese Americans and how he felt about being interned and everything. And the thing for me is that when you're a few decades separated from um, things that happened to you that were traumatic, you, you tend to romanticize them. So I love this letter because it just, it's just such a, more of a raw emotional um, response that he had to the internment. Um, dear Mr. and Mrs. Carew, I wanna thank you for your letter. You'll never know how swell and encouraging it is to hear from folks at home. It makes things much easier for us 
that there are people out there that understand our particular predicament in which we have been thrown. Um, you spoke of this year's Memorial Day as being the gravest in 24 years. Here too, the services were solemn and full of meaning of the day. Um, wait, sorry. And the full meaning of the day was driven home more than ever. It was quite a sight to see such a large assembly of people with enemy faces, but whose every thought and wish is totally American, paying tribute to this country of ours. I was amazed at the number of parents who have boys in the services also, at the number of World War veterans. Also honors were paid to soldiers of this war, but have been discharged. There are quite a number of them here, soldiers that were discharged, returned home, and then evacuated with their families. Of all the people that were honored in this service, I think the one that touched my heart more than anyone else was the former corporal stationed at Fort Lewis, Washington. When his name was called, he in full dress came to salute with all the dignity of a soldier. I came to know him later, and he has explained to me that he was discharged the day before his company was sent to sail for the Philippines. Though his company has now been taken in battle, he says he would much rather have gone with them and that he is sorry that the government found it necessary to discharge him. Incidentally, he said that there were Japanese Americans in his company and they were all discharged too. Um, I'm going to skip a little. <laughs> um, as for life here in the camp, things are constantly being improved day after day. The camp is much better in comparison to the one we first came in a month ago. Additions have been made to the mess halls, improvements in the shower rooms and the lavatory. Speaking about shower rooms, that is the only method of bathing that I miss. Wait, that is our only method of bathing, and I miss my bathtub at home. It had such a familiar ring to it. <laughs> um, gonna keep skipping, <laughs> sorry. Um, I wanna thank you for your generous offer to send food if we needed it. Our neighbor is a butcher and every day is allowed to go outside where the slaughterhouse is and he has the opportunity to go to a grocery store that is just outside the camp. I'm afraid we work him to death. We're always having to buy him, him to buy cookies, coffee, rice, and other things for us. He brought an electrical stove along with us to prepare small meals and snacks to eat late at night. You never know how good the coffee tastes. You simply can't drink the coffee they serve in the mesh halls. I don't know. What they do to the coffee there, except that it's the wrong thing. Really, Sherwin and Williams could come here and get a formula for a new paint remover. <laughs> um, the end of the letter is the part that he talks about how he feels. In the end, I assure you that we are taking this camp life in stride. The only thing we are worried about is the future and the life of us after the war. Concerned because we read in various publications that there are organizations and politicians that are seeking to deprive us of our citizenship and its rights. It's almost inconceivable to know there are some people who are so short-sighted to realize that this is the very thing we are fighting against. The brotherhood of man, the rights of the individual regardless of race, creed, or belief of religion. For this reason, I'm sending you a copy of the Pacific Citizen a Japanese-American publication from Salt Lake City that will explain somewhat the peculiar position we are in. I would like to point out the editorial page which sums up the attitude of most of us, that no matter what, through thick and thin, our faith in our country and government shall never d diminish. May I extend the biggest wishes to the family and to you, Mr. and Mrs. Crew, may God be with you always. Thank you. <laughs> um, I now want to have Natsumi Shibata come up. Okay. Okay, hello, my name is Natsumi Shibata. I'm uh, Japanese from Tokyo, Japan. And two years ago, I moved to LA for study about cinema production and get a career as a filmmaker in here. So now I'm, I'm a freelance director for an assistant director and production assistant, everything I do that. So I'm not good at English speakers, so please like listen carefully if you don't understand, just like ask me later. Okay, let's share about my grandpa's story, because my grandpa is here. My grandpa, his name is Tomoichi Sumida. I had not talked him too much because he lived at Tottori Prefecture, where he's far away from Tokyo. 
So I did not often go there because it's too far. And after I grad, after, especially after I graduated junior high school. But I know his story because my mom told me he was a special attack corps during World War II. Actually, it is called Tokotai. And my mom told me he was one of them. She heard that from him when she was a child, but he don't tell me about that. And according to my mom, my grandpa had lied suicide submarine named Kaiten. I think you don't know Kaiten. It is, this is a Kaiten. Kaiten was like small submarine with bomb, which one person can light and attack itself to American warship. And I can say this is like submarine, but I can say this is like human torpedo. However, his submarine was attacked from American warship during he went to the, his mission. Then his submarine was broken and then he survived by a Japanese warship. And he said like timber and woods, which were materials for made that submarine floated around him. Actually, after I hear this story, I feel this is weird because that submarine did not made by woods and timbers. Also, if submarine was hit by uh, American warship, he would die because the chitin, the submarine was made. That crew cannot get out by itself. So I thought he did not like the chitin. And after I heard, after at the same time, I started researching Japanese suicide troop firing World War II uh, Kamikaze Tokotai because I was making a documentary film and about like TH Kamikaze pilot. At this era, Imperial Japanese Navy prepared many suicide attacks like way, not just only uh, airplane, they have like Kaiten, also they have a boat. Then I found what my grandpa supposed to ride. I think he liked a seaside motorboard. It named Shinyo. This is a Shinyo. And Shinyo is like motorboard, which were driven by one man and carried a amount of bomb and attack itself to American warship. Like Shinyo is made by plywood, so it is really easy to broken. So I can say this board was barely, barely poor because it means that end of the World War II, Imperial Japanese Navy and Army could not have a, you know, have a money, so they cannot, they could not make like airplane, so they used boat. And Shinyo did not get a good result. Actually, absolutely, Shinyo did not get a good result in World War II, like succeed because American warship could shoot them very easily. Because you know this is really poor. So then he. Then my grandpa also like, they, I think he went, he had a mission, he went there to the Okinawa ocean and then American warship hit him and he was like thrown off from the board. Then he was helped by Japanese military state and he survived. So I am not sure what he thought about his experience because I, he did not tell me, but I can say he may, he lost his friend because his friend died because of the senior. So maybe he had so much struggle in his mind. Okay, this is a senior and also this is another story. When I made my documentary film, I met one guy. He he was also like a member of senior crew. He 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 had training as a senior crew, but he did not like the senior at least because well as went. But he told me that he did not want to die because he could, he don't he did not want to die to light a shinyo. He really wanted to survive. He really want to live. But at that time, he could not say, "I do not want to die." At this era, nobody did not know I do not want to be a suicide pilot and crew. So they had to say, "I would like to go," and this is my pleasure. But he told me that he really didn't want to go. And this is the end. I'm not sure every seaside pilot include Kamikaze and Tok uh, Kaiten and Shinyo. They want to die for Japan or their family. Maybe some of them accept it. They want to go there. They, this is their mission, but 
I do not want to say they want to go or not. Maybe some of them, they want to go. Some of them, they did not want to go. So I need to st start researching again. And my grandpa was a teenage boy at that time. So I guess this was so heavy to hold that kind of like struggle on his mind. So that's why he didn't tell me or tell his like their story to this, uh, our family. And at least after he shot by American warship, he went to Nagasaki for another mission or he just moved to the hospital. Then he was like suffered from atomic bomb in Nagasaki and he survived. But we didn't know he he went to the Nagasaki because he didn't tell us after before, just before he passed away because he afraid that maybe people discriminated him. So uh, this is a conclusion. Uh, this is a senior. Okay. This is my documentary him. So if you want to watch my documentary, this is 30 minutes and with English subtitles. So if we want to see it, I can share you later. And also, as a doc as a filmmaker, now I'm planning to make a short documentary about 442 troops for TV news program in Japan. So if I need help, <laughs> <laughs> someone can like help me. I'm like to talk about you. So thank you so much. So next is Christine Hayashi. <laughs> Good afternoon. I, I really wanted to share uh, with you about my family history. This is on my maternal uh, side, um, the Kondo family story. And I'm going to feature um, Henry Kondo, who was my great uncle. And he was a private first class in the 442. Um, he was an E company. Henry Kondo was in the press quite a bit. Um, it was included in my introduction because he was the first Nisei soldier from Pasadena to be killed in action. And so there was um, a story in the LA Times and also in the Pasadena Star News. And the article really played up his valor and his bravery and his patriotism um, to the country. This was the LA Times article. This is the Pasadena Star News. And it included excerpts from letters that he sent home and Again, his bravery, his patriotism comes through. You know, we'll do everything in our power to meet your expectations, even unto death. We're loyal Americans. We'll show those that believe that we're true Americans in every way. And I think since this comes from excerpts of his letters, this is what he truly believed in. Um, but luckily, we also have other sources that kind of give um, a personal glimpse into who he was. And those are letters that he sent to his family members. And my great aunt had the foresight to donate letters to the Japanese American National Museum. And it's been such an incredible um, experience for me to go through these letters and read them, not only from my great uncle, but also my great grandfather. Um, and just to learn more about these two men that I never had a chance to meet. This photo on the left is the Kondo family, uh, the four children. So Yuri on the left, standing in the back, she's the oldest. And then Henry is in the middle, but it actually, the order went Yuri, Misa, Henry, and then Harvey seated was the youngest. Um, and both the boys, both Henry and Harvey uh, were in the 442. And this photo here on the right is from 1937, and I think it shows the complexity of the Japanese American identity. So this is Henry, and he's on a Japanese naval vessel. I think in the 1930s, the Japanese Navy did come to the United States and dock at like San Pedro, for example. And so at the bottom here, it says he's with N. Mitoki. I don't know who that is, but it must have been a family friend. Um, there are other photographs that include like my grandmother and my great aunt and my great uncle, and they're all on this Japanese naval ship um, in 1937. This is Cherry Flores. This was my great grandparents who you see pictured here. This was their business in Pasadena. It was on Walnut, very close to Lake Avenue. Um, and they operated Cherry Flores before the war. So they were a very typical Japanese American family, very ordinary, I, I think you might argue. Um, Henry was at USC uh, at the time that war broke out, and uh, he was studying to be a pharmacist, and so the war interrupted his um, education. I included this quote from Hitoshi Samashima, who some of you might know. He was in the MIS 
Um, and I, I recognize Hitoshi. He's seated at the top, but I'm not exactly sure which one Henry is in this photograph, but this is from 1942. So the war interrupted uh, the lives of the Kondo family and many other Japanese Americans, and um, Henry volunteered for the 442 uh, while he was incarcerated at Gila. Um, and uh, so I'd like to read you some letters. And these are letters from my great-grandfather to Henry and also from Henry to my great-grandfather. Um, and I didn't edit uh, the language. So this is my great-grandfather writing in English. Um, so this is June 5th, 1943. Dear my Henry, now you are one of American soldiers and you had great Nippon Nation blood in your spirit. So you must be doing your duty for this country. Don't forget if you have chance to study hard your lesson and make you great. Please take care of your health. You are not very strong, so I worry about it. Must be careful your drinking water. We wish if you have chance to come over, see us sometime. Please don't worry about your mother and dad. We are old, but we take care of ourselves. We are very lonely. You, Harvey, and Misa are all out this weekend. Yours truly from your father. June 11, 1943. Dear Dad, thanks ever so much for those swell getta. Those are um, elevated wooden sandals. Um, have found them very good when I take a shower. How are Mother and yourself? Do you hope everything is OK? The army life is very good. And he goes into this long description of what their training is like. June 22, 1943. Dear Henry, we are all right, but everybody uh, is out now. We are very lonely at night. I am working hard all day, and mother is work at mess hall too. When nighttime is come, but no one came home, so we sat on the chair and to talk about you, Misa, and Harvey. But please don't worry about us. We are take care ourself. You stay training for 13 weeks, and you will be transferred to your respective unit. We are very glad of it. I know Mississippi is bad place, swampy, hot, just like Nippon. Please take care of yourself, dear my son. Yours truly from your father. July 1st, 1943. Dear Henry, I am glad to hear your army life is getting much better and gain more weight, but will you careful? Your hard training is making you more healthy. I wish when you came home, your weight more than 150 pounds. Henry, I am quite busy this week, but I will start your order from next week. Make nice couple pairs of getta, so you wait. We wish you take care of yourself and come home someday. Wear your uniform. July 20th, 1943. Uh, Dear father, just received your letter. Thanks a lot for those swell getta. I gave one to a friend from Hawaii who sleeps next to me. He liked them very much and told me to thank you. I also received the Gila news you sent me. Glad to read about my friends in camp. Your son, Henry. January 5th, 1944. Dear Henry, how are you? We hope you are OK. Your mother very glad to receive your Christmas gift because she needed one dresses very bad and she say those colors very suit to her. Also, she says thanks very much about those candy. You send some money for Misa and they will try to get me suit for Christmas gift. I'm very sorry to my boys and girls get me such big present this year. Yours truly from your father. April 20th, 1944. Dear dad, thanks again for the money. I went as far as St. Louis and met many of my classmates of USC. Many thanks again. Well, Dad, I guess the time has come to say goodbye for a while. Don't ever worry about me, because I'm sure that the training we've had will always protect me. Knowing that you and Mother and the rest of the family are waiting for me will make me want all the more to return safely. I do hope you mail the dependents blanks, because if it's accepted, you'll receive allowances from March on. I've also got out a bond a month allowance, too. You'll get $18.75 every month. By the way, did you get notice of the life insurance I took up? I mean notification that I've got insurance out? If so, keep it. Your son, Hank. So you notice there's a lot of repetition. Uh, there's a lot of in assuring. Um, from Henry to, to his parents to say, I'm going to be OK. I'm just fine. Don't worry about me. And there's a lot of worry from um, Yasaku to his son Henry. But you could tell there's also the sense of pride in, in his son for serving his country. Um, and what's really sad is throughout the letters, there's a lot of talk about, um, when you are on furlough, please come visit us at Gila. And Henry assures them, I'm going to come in April to come see you when I'm on furlough. In that letter in April, he tells them, I'm actually sorry, I can't make it, but I'll see you soon. 
And in fact, that, that wasn't the case. Um, he, he didn't come back. And I think that's what makes the letters even more poignant. Um, okay, my time is running out. So I'm going to fast forward and um, I'm going to read you a couple letters from um, Henry to his sister Misa. And I think these are a little bit different. He kind of emphasizes the adventure of being overseas in Europe, but he's a little bit more candid um, with what he's encountering on the front lines. July 5th, 1944. Dear Misa, glad to know all is well. I'm just fine as usual and still in one piece. I only hope that the fellows back home won't have to go into the army. It's hell here, rough and plenty tough. A few days ago, our area was bombarded by German artillery. I heard one come screaming in and then a thud, a dead hit just three or four feet in front of my hole. God knows what would have happened if it had exploded. Well, I say I missed by one inch as good as a mile. Love, Hank. And then he writes to his brother-in-law, Hal, my grandfather, um, and he's even more candid, I think. July 15th, 1944. Dear Hal, so you've had your physical recently. I only hope and pray that you boys won't have to see action over here. I imagine newspapers and magazines, etc., pretty up a lot of battles. To tell you the truth, Hal, it's something pretty close to hell. We're all in the best of health and fighting these Germans with everything we got. Until I hear from you, I just remain sincerely Hank. Um, he talks about King George uh, reviewing um, the 442. He says, sure wish I could have asked for his autograph, but that's out of the question. <laughs> um, and then you can tell the fighting on the front lines in France is getting a lot more um, um, intense. He writes, um, August 23rd, 1945, 1944, excuse me. Dearest Misa, I received your most welcome letter of August 10th today. Very happy to know that all of you are in the best of health. I'm still okay and keeping my skin intact. I'm writing this letter from my foxhole, a hole six feet by five feet by two feet, my temporary home. The crowds have been shelling this area well since they've been here. They're situated on some high mountains looking down on our throats. Isn't too pleasant. Besides, these Germans have got big guns now, and boy, when those shells hit, even a couple yards away, you feel the concussion. A couple of nights ago, a number of rounds landed too close for comfort. Boy, Misa, that, that concussion was something terrific. The shrapnel, dirt, dust, and everything around the place was flying in all directions. One large chunk of shrapnel almost tore a tree that's overlooking my hole in two. Well, Misa, like these fellows say, if one doesn't land in your hole, you're okay. And if one does, well, you won't know it. Better call it quits now. Love, Hank. And that was um, in August. And um, on October 17th, 1944, um, Henry Condor was fighting in the Battle of Briere, and he was killed in action. Um, and so I'm uh, so grateful that we have these letters uh, to kind of um, help me to understand who um, my uncle was when he was uh, in his 20s and serving in the US military. So thank you. These are all such incredible experiences that um, share the backdrop of World War II. And for every single family that went through it, there's one unique story for every person and every family. And um, it's, it's just kind of amazing, the, the varying um, dramas of each. And, um, and I, it's just very touching and moving to hear it all together and interwoven. Um, so what we're going to do now is uh, go through some questions about each of your family stories and then have some broader discussion. And in the meantime, if you have questions, um, there will be a Q&A, about 15 minutes for that towards the end. So get your questions ready and comments, and um, we'd love to hear your thoughts. Uh, so I'm going to work backwards from uh, Kristen first and then kind of go um, forward that way. Um, I can only imagine that his parents, what his parents reacted um, and how they felt when they heard the news and it was just devastating. But do you know anything more specific about um, how his family reacted when they heard that he was killed in France? I, I can only imagine too. Um... Uh, what their reaction was. I'm sure they were completely devastated. Um, Henry was 
um, their third child, but he was the oldest son. Uh, and I think there was a lot of promise for Henry um, going to USC and, and studying to become a pharmacist. Um, you can tell through my grandfather or great grandfather's letters, I mean, how much he was loved by his parents uh, and his and his family's his family members. Um, I do know that also in the collection, um, the Kondo collection at Janum, there's a letter from um, Mrs. Carr, who was uh, pretty well known in the Pasadena community. And she wrote, once she heard of the death of um, Henry, she wrote to um, Mr. and Mrs. Kondo, expressing her condolences and just saying what a wonderful you know, um, person Henry was. And uh, I think you know, I'm sure letters like that were supportive, uh, you know, helped to kind of, um, I guess, comfort the condos. Um, I do know that uh, Henry's body was disinterred um, several years later and then returned to uh, his family, and he's buried at Evergreen um, Cemetery in, in Boyle Heights. Um, and uh, I've seen photographs from that um, memorial service. So this is, you know, after the war, um, and I'm sure it kind of, of course, um, reopened a lot of the, the wounds, or, you know, the emotional wounds from um, Henry's death. And my great-grandparents just looked devastated, completely devastated. Um, and having to endure that again several years later must have been very painful. And what I'm curious about the reaction of the non-Nike community in Pasadena, uh, because it was obviously in the newspapers, um, you know, what was there a warm response or maybe even a change, or was it relatively supportive during the war? Or do you know anything about what non-Japanese Americans, how they responded to that? Yeah. Um in some ways, Pasadena was a very supportive community of Japanese Americans. Um, the Quakers um, were supportive of um, Japanese Americans and helped them upon their return to Los Angeles. Um, Esther Takei was uh, kind of a test case. She was um, brought to Los Angeles before the West Coast was returned or was opened to Japanese Americans, and she attended PCC. She had a security detail around her, so I mean, I think there was, uh, you know, some concern for her safety. Um, but I think, as a whole, there were different individuals uh, in Pasadena who really tried to help um, their Japanese American neighbors, you know, who they I think were friends with before the war, and that wasn't the case in every you know community on the West Coast. Right. And. Uh, when you were looking through these letters, you mentioned that you came across it as uh, teaching undergrads and in overseeing the collection at the museum. Was it a well-known family story for you before you, you started coming across it, or was it kind of that hushed piece of history? Yeah, um, so when, again, when I came across this, the LA Times article in a textbook, it was a US history textbook um, that I was using to teach um, undergrads US history. Um, I read Henry Kondo, and I knew that that was my great uncle, because I knew of his name. Um, but that was really all I knew about him. I knew that he was in the 442, and he was killed in action. But that's kind of the extent of my knowledge. And so I asked my aunt if she had any you know, photographs, or and she did. She had a photograph of Henry, and that was the first time I saw that, and this was just a couple years ago. And here I am, this historian who believes in the power of family history, thought I knew a lot about my family, and I didn't. Um, so uh, I just knew bits and pieces. And, and maybe my mom and, and my aunts, you know, that generation, they knew a little bit more than I did. But it wasn't something we just openly talked about. So I feel like I'm discovering it. Yeah. Yes. And I think that is that common thread between everyone. Who, well, we have this vantage point of over 70 years later, and we're all descendants from somebody who experienced it. And so it's this act of reclaiming and then being really surprised with what you find. And you're like, wait, what? <laughs> I didn't know that was my family history. Um, I have a question for both you and Nicole, because you're, well, coincidentally, both of your relatives were in Gila um, and incarcerated there. And I have a question about the the kind of narrative of patriotism that is often portrayed for the Nisei veterans and soldiers, that it was this, um, 
you know, the call to action, they're gonna prove their American loyalty, and I'm, I'm going out there. Um, and it was certainly very true, but what's also true is those mundane reasons, maybe that, or less romantic reasons people gave for or had for joining, like camp was just awful, or I, my brother was signing up, of course I was gonna say yes. Um, can each of you talk about the reasons of why as far as you know, why each of them volunteered and went into the MIS and then the 442nd. It's pretty clear from Henry's letters that he strongly believed in um, his duty to serve his country. Um, I've heard an anecdote from Tokyo Shihashi, who I guess was really good friends with my great uncle. And Tok said that on um, the day Pearl Harbor was attacked, he was with Henry Kondo, and that Henry said that he was making some statement that he was going to do something about this. And I guess for him, that was joining the military. So I guess that's his story, and so he did volunteer out of camp, which isn't always the case. Many were drafted, right? Nicole, what, have, what do you know about your grandfather's um, reason? Well, he also enlisted from camp, um, and you know he he spoke a lot about that patriotism, and you know that he couldn't believe that people would be questioning them so much and all that stuff. So I know he was, and when he. I did hear him speak about certain things. It was always, well, of course we're American, of course, you know, all that type of stuff. So I know he had that strong American patriotism, but I also know that he would get restless, you know, and and he wanted to do something else. He didn't, a lot of his letters even, um, you know, in that one letter to Mr. and Mrs. Crew, it was, you know, before he had signed up. So he, you know, he, like I said, he held those patriotic, um, sentiments, but he also, yeah, I think he was he was restless, and he didn't enlist knowing he was going to go into the MIS. They they kind of um, tagged him, and then he went into the the language school or the you know the intensive language training. He wasn't fluent in Japanese before that, um, so you know, and then him going off to China and doing translation. Um, so, you know, he, I don't think he really knew exactly what he was going to get himself into, um, but he had a lot of skills and he had a lot of drive and desire. And, um, and so I think it was probably a, a mixed bag of reasons. <laughs> a combination of both. Um, for each of you, what was the most surprising thing that you discovered through the letters? whether really revelatory or just like, oh my gosh, you know, Grandpa or, you know, Uncle Henry. What, what, was, what was one of the most surprising things that you found? Well, I think how um, just impressive the two are at writing. Um, I, I think that's a, a kind of a lost art is letter writing. Um, my, great-grandfather was Issei, so he was an immigrant from Japan, but he wrote all of his letters in English, which I think is really impressive, and I think you could kind of understand what he was conveying in his messages, so his, his English was pretty good, and that was surprising to me. Henry, uh, just being a college student, I thought was a very good writer. He's very descriptive um, in his uh, descriptions <laughs> of just daily life, which is really um, important to me as a historian. Like those, That's a very rich resource that we have. Um, and just how kind of expressive they are about their love for one another, I think is, is something that was kind of surprising to, to me as well. Um, well, I knew my grandfather was a good writer. Um, he would do the annual Christmas letters for the family and send them out, and everyone always would comment about how funny they were. He'd, you know, he'd always like to crack a joke at my grandma or something like that. Um, <laughs> But so I knew he was a good writer. I think the thing that struck me the most when I first read them was, like I said um, a little bit before, was that, you know, he really would put such a positive spin on things later. And, um, you know, I was like, you know, we just, you just do what you had to do and it was fine. And, you know, it wasn't horrible and all that kind of stuff. And, and which was true. I think his attitude, a lot of it was just like, you take it as it comes and you just, you know, you make the best of it. But I think hearing some of his frustration 
or, you know, I can't believe they're doing this. Um, he and my great grandfather and my great uncle were arrested also at one point um, for having a little refrigerator light that they claimed was, you know, because after curfew, you had to turn all the lights off. And, you know, in his letters describing that, it was just so ridiculous um, that they even, you know, did that. He's like, you had to press your nose against the window and like barely see a dim light anywhere if you even could see anything. So, you know, he had those um, experiences, but, and so he had those feelings of frustration, but yet later he was just like, oh, you know, it was fine. We're all fine. We're healthy. We're happy now. Everything is good. So I enjoyed kind of seeing that raw emotion at the time and seeing how, yeah, it was frustrating. It was ridiculous. Um, and just kind of hearing him say that firsthand, because he didn't really say that later, you know? Right, he yeah. was just sweet, funny old grandpa. Or, you know, you know, your grandfather is somebody different, and seeing them young, they're a different person. All I know is I think we need to bring swell back into our everyday <laughs> vocabulary, because I was like, that is actually a great word. Um, I <laughs> thank you for those, those responses. The letters are beautiful, um, and I have this similar question for Ayumi and Natsumi uh, in terms of your, um, your relatives going into the Japanese military. And similar question of what, how, what, how much of a sense of patriotism was there? Or was it, um, you know, as Natsumi, you and I were talking before about people were just conscripted into the military and it didn't matter, you were going. So if you both could talk about what you know in terms of why they join, and were they, was it true patriotism and a mix of emotions? And um, From what I understand, it was just what you did. So I don't think there was really a choice in whether a feeling of patriotism, it was just something you did and you just did what you were told. So that's, that's what I gathered. Okay. I think it's on. Oh, maybe the other way? Okay. Okay. Um, from my researching, I heard at that era, government like pushed to like King Asia to be a military. And military is so cool, so you should be a military. So that's why he, my grandpa went to like teenage military school like from the government and he saw like Navy is so cool rather than military at that time, because cost, like uniform are so cool. It's more like westernized. So any student, any children want to go to Navy soldier. So that's why my like grandpa want to go there. And then he, when he went there, maybe he realized the reality. And so Natsumi, I want to stay with your story uh, for now, um, were you close with your grandfather? I know you mentioned that you had moved away uh, pretty far when you were young, but did you have a good relationship with him? Yeah, I, I think so. <laughs> okay, you did. And and I'm curious how your grandfather, as far as you know, did he? How did he end up in this group of the uh, Shinyo, you know, unit? Do you have any idea how that happened? Um, I'm, I think he is really proud to join to the Shinyo group because he holds like flags because he has a like huge like Japan flag with like a lot of name from the crews. So he preserved in like his college for a long time and before just he passed away he said like we ha I had a flag and he showed us and then after he passed away, my grandma sent the flag to me and I saw it and I saw a lot of name of his friends in the Navy and his name was there and some of them like, I, I do that, you know, they can write down, I do that, I can do that. And then like some of them like write down my hits or their blood and write down the other word. So he proud, but also he like feel like so complicated mind on his mind, I guess. And complicated how? Because when he when it came to having to do it, do you think he just was terrified and was like, this is a really bad? Because idea. I think just simple, he, he didn't want to die. He can die, but he didn't want to die. So he feel like struggle. I should do that, but but in 
but I have the dream, I have a future, but you know, because he's teenage, so he wanted to like, you know, have dating with the girls, but he, he couldn't do that. So maybe, and he want to do like, he want to die, you know, he's so like, afraid to die, everybody. So I think, but he want to, he have to do that because at this era in Japan, like many people like afraid, like American army come to Japan Island itself and they saw they they sort of make a meter killed everybody. So that's why they had the brave and they tried to do that. To to save Japan and their families and Yes, yeah, save yeah. the Japan it means like save family. So mm -hmm. And and that is what is just so one of the most um, dramatic and emotional parts about it is I mean they were all just kids really um, and it, it was just so to be faced with that kind of decision or reality um, and Natsumi do you having your, your grandfather survive these two uh, near death <laughs> experiences um, do you know how that shifted the rest of his life do you feel like he was a changed person after that um, do you have any idea what he I'm not thought? sure because he's a little complicated guy so and then he actually he didn't mention he has like survived from Nagasaki atomic bomb before just he died it mean like he really really afraid that people discriminated him because after the war I heard from people a survivor from Nagasaki and survivor from Hiroshima they are survivor but they discriminated with other Japanese like now you know the people from Fukushima also like sometimes discriminated with the other Japanese. So he kept the secret and then it mean like his personality a little bit changed it because he like suspicious to others, maybe. So he was protecting your families sort of prior to this. Yeah, we dignity. said, you know, we say like Nisei, atomic bomb Nisei, because I'm Sansei too, because I didn't know that I'm Sansei. So Nisei also like discriminated with Others, even like if he if he or she want to marry, like other like pe like people like no my like son my daughter can marry because you're Nisei. Wow, it's really interesting, but right now that's not. Do you um, is that stigma still present in as, as far as the atomic bombings? Do, is that? still present in Japan or? No, I don't think so, but I'm not sure about, you know, Fukushima people is also same situation right now. Right. Mm -hmm. Nicole, I want to uh, transition to you and, and your colorful grandfather. <laughs> um, what, um, it, so you, he didn't know, you didn't know about these letters at all before you, before he died or was anyone in your family aware of them? Oh yeah, they, they knew about them, but um, okay. I just hadn't known about them. Um, so yeah, my mom and her siblings, and they, they all knew about them, but um, when they pulled them out, I said, well, where have these been? They're like, oh, they've been in that file cabinet in the back bedroom for 40 years. I'm like, oh, okay. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, really? so, and my aunt, well, my aunt did a um, report on it in college and stuff like that, so they, they knew about it, but I just hadn't, I, did, I just wasn't aware of it. My mom's like, well, what do you mean? They've been here the whole time. I was like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> do you wish you would have known because would you have just engaged with your grandfather in that conversation about the letters? Or do you feel like maybe you would have let it lie because it was? Um, I mean, there were a couple of times throughout my life where I also did like maybe a family project or something. And so I would specifically try to talk to him or my grandmother about things. Um, and so, yeah, I would have loved to do more, but I felt like I actually, he actually, I, I would hear more of his stories when he'd get interviewed by, you know, um, for the Hanashi program or, you know, for the newspaper or something, and then he would really talk about it, but it's not like he would just, you know, just start discussing it. Um, one time I did um, ask him about what our family crest or moan was because I hadn't known about it. And I just was curious one day, I just called him and said, oh, what, what is ours? And he just said, we don't have one. I said, what do you mean? So you had to have had one. He said, well, no, we didn't have one. So I kind of kept pressing and he goes, well, our family from Japan was from a village outside Hiroshima. And so 
he's like, we don't have one. And that, that was like the end of the conversation. He goes, but thanks for asking, bye. <laughs> it was on the phone. And so that conversation's always stuck with me because I thought he, in some ways, had to reconcile within himself, like, just, you know, that conflict. Um, but I know he definitely thought, you know, the bombing of Pearl Harbor was, was not smart and foolish. And so he, I think, you know, so I just, the things I think about are more from like my clinical background. Like if he had gone to a therapist and I could be a fly on the wall, how would he have reconciled all this emotions and thoughts between, you know, within himself? But, um, but yeah. Because of that conflict of, again, that sense of the patriotism and that, you know, we, our rights are being violated and we were attacked and I'm going to go out there and prove. Do you think that's what that struggle was? Or do you think it was just this, the um, sadness Yeah, I mean, of... he definitely saw the government's decision as separate from like how he saw himself as an American, you know? So I don't think he ever was gonna um, say to himself, you know, I'm not American because the government's making these decisions. I just thought, wow, knowing that you're, you know, because he was born here, of course, but knowing that your ancestors or, you know, your great, great, whatever, um, relatives, you know, their village was wiped out um, by our military, you know? So it's just, and that was, and he, but he proudly served. And so, yeah, just to have some, and then so for, for me to just ask that question, which I didn't even know would bring up anything. Um, and then he just kind of was like, yeah, we're done with this conversation. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Too hard to get into. Right. Too difficult. Right. I have a question about the couple of the photos that you showed. And one is, is that him being um, operated, operated on? on? Yes. So what was the story? <laughs> Sorry, I didn't put any descriptors no, on that. Okay. Yeah, he, that was when he was in China. Um, he had to have his appendix taken out. Oh. And they did do the surgery in like one of the cave air, because all of the, where they were in China, they all had um, these like, you know, they had built housing into the sides of hills. Um, and they were like almost like cave dwellings. And so that was just a picture of him, um, <laughs> you know. Happily having... getting his appendix taken yes. out. <laughs> yes, yeah. And uh, he had that signed dinner reception program with Chairman Mao. And yes. that's kind of, and there's a couple of photos there. Mm -hmm. Was that ever talked about openly and that, I mean, I that mean he was very... pretty proud of, you know, actually he had said that he was excited that he got to dance with Mao's wife, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. That's quite a claim to like, that was, Yeah. It was his celebrity <laughs> status. Um, <laughs> um, no, I mean that it's such a fascinating, um, experience that he had and so different than what most, um, most of the you know, the Japanese vets had. There were only a couple of, um, you know, Nisei soldiers that were placed with them in that unit, and it was a very mixed unit. Um, yeah, and actually, I'm just curious, I, uh, can you explain quickly what the Dixie mission was in China, and just a quick synopsis of that? So it was just, um, the. it was a group where the U.S. government wanted to get a report um, about um, Chair, uh, Mao, who wasn't chairman yet, Mao and Chiang Kai-shek. So they had a lot of interaction with Mao and the communist leaders and all the leaders in that area. This was before, you know, the whole McCarthyism and everything. So um, they were just there to analyze them. And my, my, I mean, my grandfather was on that mission, but he also would, um, you know, he was there for the POWs, but he said they were treated very well. There was no, there was never any maltreatment or anything, um, that kind of thing. So they had all this very personal interaction with all the communist leaders and stuff. And their report back was pretty favorable. But because the report was pretty favorable, a lot of the superiors in that group were um, blacklisted when they came back and lost their jobs and all that stuff. That's so. Right. Mm -hmm. Very singular experience in that history. Yes, that, uh, I don't think is well known, but no, fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, and then it looks like your grandfather returned and was able to to go back on like a 
kind of reunion trip or yes i mean they were so well received by the government because they had a favorable relationship mm -hmm. so before you know china even opens its doors to anyone in the united states they were able to go back um, for a visit and they were just treated very warmly and and welcomed um, and yeah so that was a positive experience that communist china had with americans back then wow. so yeah, that's pretty amazing. <laughs> um, Ayumi, I wanted to ask you about the wonderful drawings that you did, <laughs> and um, and I and I'm curious about you know what you or I love what you said about it's messy or disjointed. History can get that way, um, especially when it's passed down, um, and you've reimagined your family history through art. What was that cathartic for you, and um, does it help you? think about this history in a different way at all? Or um, how did drawing it and visually um, kind of mapping it out you know, help you think about your family? Um, the reason why I chose to draw it is because there really was no story that I could work off of that I can write out. There really is no beginning, middle, and end. Um, and then the image that I came, when my dad told me about the Galapagos of the East that he was on, and how much he enjoyed them, that was impressed him so much. I just pictured a lot of colorful flowers, and so I started from there. That was one of the first things I drew. Um, so yeah, oh, what was your question? Yeah, that was so exactly it. it yeah, so that was my starting point. The starting point. Yeah. It was it was almost just this, you know, from through his eyes, mm -hmm. the humanity behind it. Um, and I loved also what you said about your when it came to your parents. Um, so they were growing up post-war, is that what was, okay, and they had this feeling of they just need to make things work mm -hmm. um, in that post, you know, in that economic boon of um, Japan. Do you feel that that was a means of them coping with the destruction of um, Japan? Do you think that they, you know, was that something that they just felt like we're just kind of gonna be focused on this and I don't want to talk about the past or what do you think that was and for your I parents? Th I think that was the case. I think they were, they were just so hyper focused on just rebuilding and I think but my I talked to my parents the other day and they said there was always there was always a cloud that it was always in the background. You know, a lot they didn't have a lot of things growing up. This was all everyone had they were coming from a place of scarcity all the time. So I think there were some remnants of that. It wasn't like, you know, but I think, yeah, I think that was what you said was what they experienced. A means of them coping. And, uh, and that kind of brings me to um, my o overall question I'd love anyone to answer is this idea of things getting passed down intergenerationally. I know for uh, people who descended from the incarceration in the camps, we talk a lot about intergenerational trauma that um, kind of came from the silence of not being told anything, but all the yonsei or you know younger are are almost uh, somewhat not burdened, but we understand there's this enormous history we're holding um, in reclaiming all these family stories. Have you have any of you felt like that's um, a part of you? You know that the, I, I have this responsibility now to share the story and retell it and save it for anyone that wants to start. I think for me, talking to my parents, I understood why these stories weren't shared. And I feel like for my grandparents, part of it was just out of love that they didn't want to their children to know something that was so painful to them. So I think they were kind of protecting the next generation. And I think from my parents or my generation, it was out of respect that we didn't ask because we didn't want to reopen the wounds. So I'm not sure if my grandfather's alive, if I, I don't know if I can bring myself to really ask anything. Um, well, I guess in my case, um, I think our, our family was so removed from our Japanese um, heritage and culture, and I think I've sought that out. You know, I wanted to learn the language, I wanted to visit Japan and see ancestral homes, um, and learn more about the culture. 
And then, you know, I've gone back to school for multiple degrees to become a historian, and my research interest is Japanese American history. So I guess I definitely feel compelled <laughs> to tell this, this narrative. Um, I work at the Japanese American National Museum as well. So I definitely believe that this is uh, a lesser known story and uh, needs to be told. Um, so I definitely feel that burden, but I see it as an opportunity um, to, to share the story. For me, this is not only my grandpa's story. When I made a document film, my supervisor asked me why you want to make it, because they have a hundred of like story about why it's already like, they have a lot of movies, they have a lot of like documentary and news program also like they show why you want to make it again. And then I just want to say, I want to, say, I want to show this film to teenage next generation. So I made it and after that, I have like some I, after I showed my my documented video, it now is shown in junior high school in Japan, like it's one of educational video right now. So I think maybe young generation do, don't know why we should not have a war, you know, because it is this is so hard to if you guys like ask like, your child why why is not good, it's difficult to answer. It's easy to answer. Like, why it's not good, but they ask me the reason. So now I know I can say the word, like teenage also go to the world and they have to think, they have to die. And like they're gonna like, you know, the face to they have to die. And teenage, they have a future, but their future is, you know, gone. So it's, this is a war. So that's why I have to tell. You know, the why is not good. There's never enough stories that could be told, <laughs> I, I think. Um, this is a question for all of you. Um, and so, I mean, if you want to start, if, if uh, your grandfather or, um, you know, any relatives that experienced it were to come back right now <laughs> or for a day, uh, what would you want to ask them? What's one? It's difficult. What's one question that you would want to know? I would want to know what he thinks of the Constitution possibly being changed in Japan. I think he would have a lot to say about that. Wow. What do you, I'm curious, what do you think he would, how would he respond? I can't imagine someone who's experienced war being okay being able to reconcile with that idea. I, I, I think he would really strongly disapprove. Nicole? Um, I, I don't know that it would necessarily be a question I would have actually asked him, but more of just, you know, I'd be curious, you know, not only how he reconciled all those conflicting possible emotions or feelings, but also, if he knew what was going to happen, would he have done anything different? Would his perspective been different? Would, if he, would he have wanted anything, um, yeah, differently? I don't know. I'm, like I said, I, he wouldn't have been able to go back and change anything, but it just in my mind, I would be curious as to if he had known what was coming, you know, yeah, would, anything, would he do anything different? he had that knowledge before or knew everything, how would his actions have shifted or changed? Yeah. And, yeah. And, and maybe he wouldn't have done anything differently, but just having that knowledge because none of them thought that would have happened. You know, none of them knew, like before, obviously, the bombing of Pearl Harbor, none of them imagined that would have ever happened. So just having the knowledge, you know, would he have been more of an activist? Would he been, you know, I don't know, mm -hmm. <laughs> just, yeah. Maybe with his personality, <laughs> that could have been possible. Uh, Kristen? I think I'd probably want to ask my great uncle um, if he didn't feel like he needed to prove his loyalty, would he have volunteered? Um, if his parents weren't incarcerated behind barbed wire, would he still have volunteered? Uh, and then I think the other thing too is under such duress, how was he able to write such um, polished prose and talk about such mundane things, you know, from his foxhole. For me, 
for me, I want to ask him after he got the mission as a Tokotai, do you want to go or not? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> it's the simplest question. Yeah. You're right. Um, I'm curious if um, this is for anybody to answer. What do you wish more people knew or understood about um, World War II, either from the Japanese American side or from the Japanese perspective, um, that you feel is not well known or understood? Is there something that you think needs to be talked about more that um, the general public may not know about this experience? <clears throat> Um, I mean, I think we're, we're part of, we're part of that. I mean, I think that, um, so many people didn't know just the experience period. It wasn't, I feel like, like you said, our generations are, seem to be rekindling these subjects more and more. People seem to be speaking about it. There's an urgency to gather these stories, um, you know, because so much of the population is, you know, either past or in their 90s. Um, and just why, for example, the Japanese American community came to support the Muslim community when they were facing persecution. Like, if people don't know the history, they don't understand why that would have happened or why that would have been the response. Um, and I think just simple things of people even knowing that everyone's life, businesses, schooling, everything was taken from them at that time. And just, you know, because I remember in high school, it was like one paragraph about it. And so I, I think we're, we're part of that uh, conversation. Um, I think these letters uh, tell such a different narrative than the one that the federal government was telling at the time. And so I, I even though they're very personal, I um, hope that others could see the thought process of an Issei and um, an Issei soldier who volunteered for his country. Um, it shows the humanity. It shows that they were, uh, that they loved this country and were willing to, to fight for it, so. So I have a final question for, for all of you, and, and then I think we can open it to um, the audience for questions and comments. Um, do you believe there, or do you feel like there um, is more connection and understanding to be had between um, the pre-war you know, uh, Japanese American groups and uh, Shinike or um, you know, people that newly migrated to the U.S. at post-war, um, and if so, you know, how can we find that connection? Or do you feel like we're already a tight-knit group and uh, sharing this this ancestry? Or where do you think there there's more room for connection between the two groups? I think spaces like this, right, is kind of the bridge. Um, I do, I, because I'm from Japan, I don't relate to the internment experience of the Japanese American narrative, but I think that story is just as significant. And I would love for the Japanese school children to learn about it too. And I think, um, I think there's a lot of things that are starting. Natsumi, do you wanna go? Okay, for, I, I mean, I'm totally like, Japanese, I have a shy Japanese, Jap, only Japanese citizens think I'm Japanese. But now, I, I, I did not have any interest in Japanese American culture recently. But my supervisor, I'm working, I'm like, now like working for like some one Japanese broadcasting company and he asked me to research, start researching about Japanese American history. So that's why I met Andy. And then I was, uh, you know, now I'm starting researching about 442 troops. Okay. I think many Japanese, you know, in Japan, they don't know about 442. And they don't know what happened to the Japanese yeah. Americans. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because yeah. okay. this is, you know, I'm, I, was, I was like one of them. So now I have to 
tell because I feel like connection with Japanese American culture right now because I heard from like story about like Japanese American like, what they heard in the past and right now and so now I feel like I have to make it and I have to show it because I feel connection so maybe Japanese people in Japan also can feel connection with Japanese Americans so Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you are being that bridge as a filmmaker, which is so important. That's amazing. Um, Kristen, do you have thoughts about that? Um, well, I, I think that, our, I mean, we share a, a similar heritage, right? We um, share a similar culture, and, and I think our reasons for coming to the United States uh, are probably similar if we look at it. And um, so I agree that that we need to share more about each other's experience. And I think that's why this event has been so illuminating, you know, to see that whether you're fighting for Japan or the United States, you know, that these are all humans, you know, young men who um, ha I think shared a lot in common, so. And all the families that they left behind. And that's also, that's so touching to see that, you know, all the people that they affected with their, whatever happened to them. Nicole, any? Last thoughts about that? Um, no, I mean, honestly, I I think a lot of connection can be had because that was a topic I hadn't really thought of as much before, and I think it was a great idea to, to include that. And I think from the J perspective, a lot of times we don't think about that, and that's not something that, you know, um, comes to mind right away is how it was experienced for people in Japan during that time. You know, I think we were so focused on our story here, um, but I think, I think for sure, that's um, it's important, you know, to have that. Like you said, that bridge. Yeah. Well, thank you all for such wonderful answers. Uh, I think we can open it up to the audience for about a fifteen-minute Q and A. Uh, oh, five at ten-ish. <laughs> ten, five ten. 10 minute Q&A, uh, so if um, anyone has questions, just raise your hand and I think Andy's going to run this mic up to you. Don't be shy, this is a very supportive environment. <laughs> As I understand it, there was the Japanese 442, which liberated Dachau. What was the relationship with that group and, and the citizens of Dachau to these Japanese as they were coming in these various cities that had not seen Japanese before? I don't know if any... I know that's so the... Uh, the group that liberated Dhaka was the 522nd. And uh, yeah, no, but you are right. Yes, it was uh, part of it. And uh, I only know this from a, um, a woman who works at uh, LTSC, Little Tokyo Service Center. Her uh, grandfather was part of that group. And she said that um, her grandfather was one of the first people that was there. And um, one of the prisoners thought Japan had won. And, they, and I guess their response was, just kill me now, please. Um, I don't want to live. And he said, no, I'm American. And they were just like, what? <laughs> and, and so I think it was just what you're expressing, kind of a shock. Um, and uh, I don't know too much about um, what the, you know, right now, what that link is with, you know, specifically that death camp and uh, the memory of the Japanese Americans, but. You know, I don't know if I can really speak to that, but I know that they got there first and then they were, I think, followed up with the rest of the military. Um, if anyone here knows a little bit more about the specific, I can't really speak on those particulars, but I know that they were the first people to reach the camp, to reach Dachau, so. Uh, I think we have a question over here, yes. Hi, I have a question for uh, Natsumi. Oh, okay. Hi. Uh, I was wondering, um, if your grandfather didn't survive, would your mother or father be born? You, what do you mean, like, 
he, he died because I'm mean, not egotistic. Yeah, yeah so I'm asking if your parent, or I don't know if it's your mother or your father um, that's related to your grandfather, mm -hmm. but was were they born after he survived and returned? Yeah, 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 yeah. So effectively, if he had performed his mission or didn't survive Nagasaki, yeah, yeah, you yeah. wouldn't be here. Yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. I just want to clarify that. Thank you. We're very happy you're here, not to me. <laughs> uh, anyone else? Oh, I think there's one here, Andy. Thank you. Um, my question is, is more to the point of the discrimination that was mentioned for surviving, I guess, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I guess it's my cultural um, lack of knowledge. I, I, I don't know. Why it is, what is that exactly? Why does that exist? Like, you know, right now, the people in Fukushima, like our atomic, uh, I hope not, the factory is bombed, and then people like suffer like cancer. And like, gene generally something happened, because people don't know what's happening in their body after we have like atomic bomb in Nagasaki and Hiroshima, because many people died. So many people think that survivor had something wrong in their body. So that's why they discriminated them. Anyone else have? Are you, oh, are you up there? Steven. <laughs> One second. <laughs> oh. <laughs> So first of all, I want to thank all of you uh, for sharing with us, especially how different it is, experiences were. I mean, there's a lot of similarities that were mentioned, but there's also huge differences, you know, because what happened in Japan versus what was happening here. And as a Japanese American, you know, I'm extremely fascinated. You know, this last question that was asked um, when I went to Japan to see sort of the sort of the experiences there and the different kind of feeling and the outcomes that come from it. So I'm really, I'm really happy that we're having this dialogue. What I really want to have, I really want to ask um, each of you or any of you um, is, or I guess all of you, is um, what, what um, as you listen to, as you spoke today and shared with each other today, um, how has that, uh, has it done anything, has it sparked anything in you um, to, to um, to want to reach out or reach into and reach beyond um, uh, what you just heard from the other side, from the other experiences. And the reason why I ask is because um, the thing that bothers me the most about World War II was the disconnection between us, between those from our ancestral home and um, those here in the United States, and that disconnection that took place and that big void um, that's there. And so. I'm just curious about how your thoughts are, what your thoughts are relative to that. That's a big question. Um, does anyone wanna? What, what do you mean by other side? Like, oh. um, the other side, I think to. Um, so, oh, I'm sorry, on that. as a Japanese, the Japanese American experience, as Japanese Americans, the Japanese experience. So does it make you want to explore more of, say, the experience that was not yours, but from, um, you know, just to delve into that more, to understand more? I think for me, it was a really the first time I've asked questions about the war and talked about it with my family. So I reached out to my cousins, my parents, and we've never had this conversation. So for me, that was a really deep experience. So. I would love to learn more about our family, what we what we learned, and really go from there. Um, I I imagine this is a pretty common story that it's not talked about. Um, yeah, I think that the thing the thought that comes up for me too is just about culture, because I feel like something that I thought that happened was 
after the war, a lot of the Japanese Americans, you know, weren't speaking Japanese, for example, just the language and the culture. I think there was such a, a you know, feeling that they had to just be American. Um, and so I see people now wanting to maybe go back and learn more about the Japanese culture, you know, the language and all that stuff. And I think that's part of, you know, they had, they had to feel like there was a disconnect a little bit. So I think bridging that gap again and, and making it okay, you know, to have that Japanese culture too and to be American. Um, and for sure, like I said, it hadn't really dawned on me to have this type of different experience and perspective. So I do think that that is it. It did ignite something in me um, to know more. Um, I showed that photograph of my great uncle on the Japanese naval ship uh, before World War II, and I wonder what happened to Mr. Mitoki. And it makes me uh, wonder if we had—I'm sure. Oh, well, we definitely had relatives, distant relatives in Japan, and and what was their story? I've been so focused on my Japanese American uh, relatives. And so I'm sort of just wondering, yeah, how was uh, the Kondo family in Japan uh, affected? Okay, for me, I just like start researching about 442, so you just started. <laughs> you are about to find out a lot. So yeah, 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 yeah. you really <laughs> are gonna <laughs> learn that. Um, that's a great question. Image? Oh, yes. <laughs> Andy's running it over. <laughs> Get your exercise today, Andy. Uh, so my name's Mitch Maki, and I'm the president of Gulf Broke National Education Center. And I just want to thank our four panelists for joining us here today and engaging in this wonderful discussion. And Diana, thank you for facilitating such a great discussion. At Gopher Broke National Education Center, one of the issues that we're concerned about in the Japanese American community is a divide between the traditional Japanese Americans, when I say traditional, meaning those who came pre-war, the traditional Issei, Nisei, Sansei, and what we refer to in the community as the Shin Nikkei, those Japanese who came post-war. And that oftentimes in our community, there's a feeling that we're not always on the same page and that the communication isn't the same across these two groups. And today's discussion, I think was a very positive step in moving us towards having a discussion truly as a Japanese American community, part of which was here during World War II and part of which was not and came after World War II and whose history was in Japan at that time. So no question here other than a very heartfelt thank you to each of you for participating in this and thank you for everyone in the audience for coming and, and being a part of this today. Well, from what we've been uh, discovering and being uh, uh, exposed to is that culturally, if you are traditional Issei, Nisei, Sansei, so like myself, for example, I don't speak Japanese. It was my grandparents who came. And when they came, they came from a Japan that was in the Meiji uh, period. So the values of Japan are very different than the values of Japan today, 120 years later type of thing. Uh, the Shin Nikkei, who have recently arrived or have been here maybe only one or two generations, do speak Japanese, uh, culturally are different in many ways. And sometimes when we have public programs in the Japanese American community, it's not as broad or as inclusive as we would like it to be. Let's see, do we have time for one more or, okay, we do have time. Is there a Final question anyone would like to ask? OK. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Um, we are going to be uh, milling around a little bit. And please take a look at the letters. And a close-up of Ayumi's sketches are also out in the lobby. So, um, And we've also got a lot of material out there. Um, so thank you again. And please join me in uh, giving them a round of applause for their wonderful story. Thank you. Have a great weekend, everyone.